Welcome everyone um, to the Canadian Music Center's uh, talking circle. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give a really, really, really brief uh, introduction to the session, how it came about um, before I uh, hand things off to our moderator, Jessica McMahon. And um, Holly, if you can sort of admit people as they um, are joining. It's Jeremy Strawn. I'm a, a music researcher and um, performer, although less so of late. I'm, uh, I'm in Ottawa, Ontario right now. Um, I'm a white uh, male, middle-aged person wearing glasses. Um, and the gathering here has uh, been sort of long in planning, but sort of uh, very quickly came together as we were preparing to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, this CMC talking circle has been part of a number of initiatives that the Canadian Music Centre has been uh, working with, um, with regards to the organization's um, move towards inclusivity, um, decolonization, equity, diversity initiatives. The CMC's struck a, a number of projects and councils, um, people who are invested in seeing organizational and structural change in the arts. And we have been working um, in various capacities on a number of um, like uh, initiatives. Um, so this event is part of that work that's been ongoing. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to see everyone here. Um, just ask that you mute your microphone uh, and keep your camera off while the participants are um, engaged in discussion. And if you could just drop in the chat um, where it is that you're signing in from, that would be wonderful. Um, I'm here uh, on Algonquin and Anishinaabe lands as a guest. Um, in the Alta Vista region of Ottawa, south of the Kitasipi River. And I'm going to leave it there and pass it off to Jessica. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica McMahon, and I am from Kauza's First Nation in Saskatchewan. And I am currently in Cochrane, which is just outside Calgary, which is in uh, the Blackfoot country uh, also resides within Treaty 7 area, which is also now home to the Stony Nakoda and the Satina people. Um, and also the Métis Nation has an office here, uh, which is called Region 3. So um, I'm really happy to welcome everyone here. And I would like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves a little bit about um, what they do and who they are, and then we can jump right into these questions that um, the CMC has provided for us. <laughs> I think I forgot something. Oh, my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> I'm an Indigenous woman wearing blue glasses um, and a black shirt. Um, yeah. I'll go next. Um, my name is Chris Dirksen. I'm half Cree, half Mennonite. I like to call myself a Cree Mennonite from Northern Alberta, Treaty 8, uh, North Tucker on my dad's side, Buffalo at Hills on my mom's side. I currently pay rent in Takaranto, and that's where I live, but uh, I'm still in Vancouver after a show with the BSO uh, last weekend. Um, and it's nice to see you all here. Oh, and I'm wearing a black hat. I've got big glasses, I got two braids, and a blue hoodie. Uh, Andrew, would you like to go next? Oh, sure. Uh, Tansi, Ani. Um, my name is Andrew Balfour. I am originally from, my blood is originally from Fish, uh, Fisher River First Nation in southwestern Manitoba. I'm pre-descent. I was uh, raised in Winnipeg. But now I live in Takaranto, the Mississauga to credit, um, District 1 Spoon uh, territory. Um, and I'm a composer um, and singer and conductor. So it's a great honor to be here to take part in this very important conversation. Uh, Jason, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. So I'm Jason. I am currently a PhD candidate in Calgary, which is on the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. 
Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta. Region 3, as many should know. I'm actually from uh, the um, Ontario Treaty Nation as well. I'm part of the Métis Nation of Ontario. My grandmother was Cree, uh, or is Cree, I shouldn't say. She didn't stop being Cree just because she passed away. <laughs> uh, so she... Um, she was from the Mushkegolak uh, tribe in northern Ontario on the Moose Name Moose Factory grounds. She was actually born in Wiskaganish, which is also another Moose Cree uh, settlement, but um, she transferred from there quickly after she was born because her father moved to Moose Knee for work, so she was raised in Moose Knee. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for me, I'm wearing a black shirt. I got, I'm the only one with headphones on <laughs> and uh, wearing black glasses. And Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself? Anchi, Pat Carabray, Dishinekashun. My name is Pat Carabray. I uh, was not born with that name. My first name was Ronald Joseph Nall. Um, and I'm from the homeland of the Metis Nation. I'm a member of the Manitoba Metis Federation. Um, on living on, was for many years living on Treaty 1 and 2 land and the homeland of the Metis Nation. I'm now in Vancouver as the uh, director of the School of Music at UBC and the Chan Center. Um, I come to you from unceded Musqueam land, um, and I'm very honored for the good relationship that UBC has with the Musqueam and for the support that we have for each other and the, the learning and, and art making that happens in, in this uh, territory. Um, I'm wearing blue glasses, it seems to be the theme. Uh, there's a sub theme of blue glasses. I have gray hair, uh, a kind of a lovely painting behind me that uh, rip, was rip, uh, created after the pianist performed my first piano concerto. Um, so the piano concerto is woven in and out of it. So it's pretty prominent here. And I have a shirt that looks like it's got three or four colors in it. And I'm the old guy. Okay, well, thank you um, for introducing yourselves, and I'm really happy to meet you as well. Um, okay, so the first question that we are here to discuss today is um, how can the CMC, which is uh, the Canadian Music Centre, and uh, Western Classical Music, in quotation marks, um, organizations in general, uh, create a welcoming and nurturing space for Indigenous composers, music creators, musicians, and audiences. Who would like to <laughs> jump in with, <laughs> with answering that or starting off our discussion? I'll go first, since nobody else is. <laughs> um, I, I don't necessarily <laughs> it's not necessarily a sense of welcoming it's sort of like a sense of respect for me uh, when i think about how indigenous composers are approached and indigenous composition i think there's a really big lack of definition of what indigenous composition is and then i think that the main problem why there's a lack of what indigenous composition is is they're not allowing indigenous people to define what indigenous composition exactly is i um often refer to indigenous and like indigenous O-U-S and indigenist I-S-T composition when I write and I refer to indigenous composers as a composition as anything that comes from an indigenous person. I've been asked before, oh, is your composition for this project going to be indigenous? And I'm like, well, I'm indigenous. So yes, my composition is going to be indigenous. Uh, I consider anything that's not by an indigenous person that's influenced by an indigenous um, sort of reference or culture of any kind or the indigenous sound, so to speak, um, as indigenous composition and then that's where it starts to become problematic so i think that if we're going to create a welcoming space for people they need to view that as a definition just because you're using indigenous elements in your composition does not make your composition indigenous composition I'd like to pipe in, I guess that's such a probably one of the better descriptions, uh, Jason, um, in terms of that, that helps me actually in terms of to identify what I do. 
Um, and probably the most the thing I took away from from what you just said is as an indigenous person, anything I write is indigenous like in terms of whether I'm writing about the, the fall of Berlin or, or you know, uh, a historical event has nothing to do with indigenous people. It's still indigenous work. I look at the question, uh, is, is the second part of that question to being really important. Um, and that, that general, generally speaking is how institutions are welcoming and uh, including indigenous or people of minority or diverse cultures into their space to experience what we call classical or Western Eurocentric music. Um, you know, there's a bigger problem in terms of how we are pro what we are programming, why we're programming it um, for either for financial reasons because it's the it's the touchstones for the so-called uh, you know classical repertoire or what have you. I think the most important thing is that all the halls, the recital halls, the churches or whatever, that these venues need to be made accessible, um, welcoming, and all the respect and re protocols involved. Um, a lot of halls, especially classical symphonic halls in Canada, are downtown, um, and it's it's already imposing to go into those halls. Um, it's one thing for a music director and administration in a um, in an orchestration, an orchestra, or an opera hall, or ballet to be uh, totally welcoming and totally understanding and sympathetic and, and following the calls of action. But your frontline workers are your ushers, your security guards, your box office people. The, you know, the, the first point of contact while going to, uh, to, to experience, whether it's a new work, um, whether it's going to see Jeremy Dutcher or Chris Dirksen or what have you, it's the people that work in these institutions that have not been trained, have not uh, have the, the, the proper awareness of really being uh, welcoming and offer safe spaces for people of color, indigenous people that are experiencing perhaps going into a hall for the first time, um, reaching out to communities to actually make them aware of, of uh, you are welcome here. Um, and it's, it's often difficult because many of these, these institutions don't own the hall, don't, you know, don't have a run of the management. So until we, you know, I, I'm, I'm making a bigger generalization here because this doesn't necessarily have to do with CMC, but the second part of the question actually has everything to do about all institutions that call themselves classical is that we need to create safe spaces. We, uh, and apart from the fact that our in, uh, numbers are dwindling, uh, the aids of patrons are getting uh, much more advanced that we, for, uh, for, for this music that we love so much to survive needs to in, be way more inclusive way more safer platforms for both the creativity and the experience of of of, of this music um i think that's a huge a huge step towards actually making this music relevant no matter how well it's played or whatever the intentions are if you do not create a safe space for people to experience it it will honestly not survive that's sort of way i feel um even pre uh, post uh, pre-pandemic you know yeah. we have a lot of work to do and I think like we should also like touchstone upon the classist um, the classist issues that come up with class music, and you know we all need to be trained in a certain certain way, and uh, and it comes with a lot of uh, often privilege. It often comes with having to live in a city and not on on uh, on the land. And I think like how we welcome folks into into your building is so huge. And that is about like classism. And if you're programming indigenous works, like let's see some let's see some price cuts for funding for indigenous folks to come and experience it because it's it's not inclusive and it doesn't involve involve everyone, which I think it needs to. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Um, I guess for me, truth has to come first, right? And the truth is that Western classical music is predicated on a pretty awful model where the only good composer is a dead composer, preferably German, preferably male. Um, and that the hierarchy and privilege of that structure keeps people down, keeps people out, and is not welcoming by its very nature. I mean, it's based, and, and for me, the worst part of it is that the incarnation that we have 
of the classical music industry right now is is one of the um, the least open of the in the history of classical music in that <clears throat> we're so bound by the way funding is doled out by the way you know union contracts are are written um, if one wants to engage with people from different cultural backgrounds on the stage making music together you have to do it differently you can't just say you got 20 minutes of rehearsal for this thing and then we're going on i mean <clears throat> one must and and for me it's i'm trying to position it in a way that the the history of western culture and rights is basically built around the idea that as soon as someone's dead you can do pretty much whatever you want with their stuff you know so you can take whatever music you want and you can present it in whatever way you want but the reality is with our music we're here and you need to engage with us and our communities if you're gonna do the right thing you know, and, and I think that's very difficult. I understand how complicated it is. I've worked in the industry for my whole life <clears throat> and it costs more, it takes longer, it's harder, but it's the right thing to do. And somehow we have to figure it out. You know, like I, I the, the model I often look to nowadays is somebody like Gordon Gerard in, in Regina who has the Truth and Reconciliation Report on his desk every day, you know, he's thinking about it. And I think all of our organizations, if we're going to get through to reconciliation, we have to recognize the truths, the hierarchical kind of injustices, the privilege that many parts of our culture feel. Um, and, you know, like I, I find myself in the role of what I used to call the angry prairie dog, you know, who pop up and complain about hey, what, you just can't not think about this stuff just because you live in Toronto or because you're at a symphony orchestra concert or whatever. We have to think about this stuff and it's, uh, it's a hard road and it's, there is no foreseeable end point to it at this point. Reconciliation is going to take a long, long time. And as everybody said, it involves <clears throat> rethinking how the gatekeeping happens, whether that's to young people engaging with music, whether it's audiences going to concerts, whether it's composers being programmed, um, you know, all, all of these things are, are going to take a long time and, and they're going to require some very careful thought and some restructuring of, of how we do what we do. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, I think, you know, this question is, is really large, but I also believe that it, this question has been discussed quite a bit and quite at length in various spaces and places over the past two years. Um, and I think hearing this question, there's a lot of answers that are out there. I think they just need to be implemented. There's always tangible solutions that have been offered through panels like this. And as you've heard people here today already offer tangible solutions. I think what we're waiting for now, at least personally, is um, the implementation of those things. Um, the waiting around for this when, when people have heard this over and over again. I see Jason, your hand is up. Um, I listened to Laurie Blondeau last week uh, telling a panel of people that I've been saying this for 50 years. Why are there not any more? Why aren't there more Indigenous curators and why are you not supporting them? And so I think that it's a it's a call to action, um, which is also through this reconciliation. Um, Jason. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, if I put my hand up, it's just because I don't want to interrupt anyone. So I'll, I'll sit and patiently wait for you to call my name. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to say a few things. I, I, I was listening very intently and I, I, I loved everyone's responses to this. Uh, what I thought Andrew said in support to what I said earlier is quite telling. And I think I think we should really 
anybody here should really focus on that. Uh, because I'm Indigenous, my compositions are almost expected to have Cree titles or sound Cree uh, musically. Uh, but that's not what defines me entirely as a composer. You know, my grandfather was white and so was my father, so I'm visibly white. Uh, and I have pieces that are on subjects that do not pull from my indigeneity within Canada. They're not any less Indigenous than any of my other pieces because that, the subject matter is not a direct reflection of my Indigenous heritage and views. And then sort of just to pay it forward, I also really agree with what Patrick was just saying. Indigenous music on a whole is highly connected uh, to Indigenous culture and spirituality. Uh, so for example, I'm, I can only speak from the Cree tradition because that's what I'm from. In Cree culture, songs and words and stories have uh, spirituality to them, spirits, like they're living beings uh, within them. And to take and borrow from these without engaging with the existing community is not just deeply disrespectful, but it's also very spiritually damaging to the ancestors and the lives of the Cree people that are existing today. Uh, and I just kind of thought I would... Uh, reinforce what that and what Patrick was saying, because I feel it's really important as a person. Entirely. And another thing that um, I've been thinking about recently, I am friends with uh, Daniel uh, Bartholomew Poiser, who's a Black conductor, and we've been talking, uh, and I think Parmalai, maybe you were there, but like, how do we make classical music nice again? Like, I think that's something that like if we're going to talk about welcoming how do we like how do we take those hierarchical um positions and 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 you know still have a conductor but you know somebody who understands the music and like spends time with the music we talked about that and i think that's for all all new compositions need more than uh 20 minutes you know like the orchestras have already played all of those works before. They've been playing them those works since university, you know? They, they know the stuff. So to give uh, new composers actual time on their pieces is super vital. Um, and I think, like, just looking at Vancouver's programming this year, they have Andrew, they've got Ian, they've got, like, Miriam, they got Melody, they've got, like, uh, Melody Courage, like they've really done a lot in one one season to be more inclusive, um, and I think it's just like yeah, it's it's time, do it. That's it. <laughs> I think that uh, I totally agree with so much that's been said. Uh, everything that's been said. I think actually that orchestras and opera companies need to take a page out of the way choirs are doing it right now. I think most of you know that I'm mostly choral based and quite you know. And I'm seeing such outstanding listening and understanding in the choral world that it's going to be so substantial that it's going to change the landscape of choral repertoire in this country. Um, and I think it's nothing but positive because I, I get it because choirs are smaller. They don't have necessarily the same type of hierarchy they used to. You know, the such and such singers, a male, white guy being, you know, identified as that's his vision and, and what have you. Um, I'm seeing choir directors, not only in Canada, but also in the United States, really reaching out and saying, one, we want to learn about um, not just my choral music, but the Indigenous composers, how they approach music, listening, finding the money to come in and workshop, because Jessica and I are involved in a project with, with Luminous Voices in Calgary next year. Um, Chris and I have worked with uh, my new group, uh, well, Camera and Nova, but now we're known as Dead of Winter. Um, I'm just sort I'm seeing so many understanding in the choral world. Um, and it, really what it is, it's listening. It's absolute listening, you know? And I, and I think for the orchestral program, I understand it's such a bigger uh, uh, entity. And actually Pat said it the best, it's, it's an industry. Um, it has been an industry since, you know, the, the invention of recording. And it's turned into this, I think it's almost like a massive death star of, of an industry where it's so hard to break through, you know, the force fields of, of that's trying to protect itself. And it really, I think it's just, um, it's, it's, you know, we're, I guess, we're the, I mean, I hate using the Star Wars uh, analogy, but we're the Rebel Alliance, you know, we're trying to like break through those force fields of, of, of resistance to try to protect itself. It's like, what are you protecting for? Why do why are we, th are you so threatened? Um, and, you know, I do, I totally agree with the, the titles I'm seeing in orchestras right now, like such as the Vancouver Symphony and the Winnipeg Symphony is getting it right and has been doing a fairly good job in the last little while too. And others like as as Pat said about Gordon in uh, in Regina, but you know I think the big orchestras, the big ones, Toronto, Montreal, they're still you know 
it, it's difficult to break down those barriers. And I think programming, as I keep on saying this over and over again, stop indigenizing music that, you know, stop making Pierre Gint into an indigenous story. Stop, you know, trying to think, oh, this is a good idea. We'll have a white person, you know, program this so-called, we'll have Barbara uh, Kroll and Chris and my, or Ian's work. And then we're going to have the second half being Pierre Gint narrated by, you know, like uh, an indigenous, you know, like it, it, that's ridiculous. Like it's just, who's making these decisions? Probably a foreign born conduct artistic director. Somebody that wants to do good, somebody that wants to try to understand, but hasn't been sat down with elders or hasn't sat down with an indigenous artist. Most of our conductors in this country are foreign born. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want to program music, you are, you're going to have to go into the community, go into your city and go into to the core, go talk to the community workers, go talk to uh, indigenous elders or teachers. If you want to, if, if you want to program music that might be indigenous themed, please. Please, and we've been begging you for a long time. Please listen to the community rather than just thinking this is a great idea. Um, you know, it reminds me of that great uh, documentary um, you can watch on YouTube, but Drew Hayden Taylor going into Germany called Searching for Winnetou. It's just, the, you know, it's just like all these crazy Germans, you know, dancing around with blonde hair and blue eyes and with regalia on. That's the type of thing that it seems to us when you, when you indigenize, you know, European classical music. Um, it's a little bit of a tangent here, but it's one thing that we've been talking about. All of us here in this panel have been talking about for several, several years. So I think that that's one thing the Canadian Music Centre can help if you want to be true allies, help us to get that message across to these massive institutions. I also think we need to touch on the appropriation aspect a little bit as well. Like, and with the CMC's library, I, I heard there was some, some movement in maybe looking at the library and looking at what is um, what has been taken from us, you know, like, heck man, we've given a lot, <laughs> like, as Indigenous people, and and the way that it looks to us and it feels to us is like our music is being mined as well, um, and like mined as in mining. Um, so I think like CMC looking at what is in the library and, and maybe some things are not appropriate anymore and and just you know letting go of things that that are of the past if we want to keep moving forward uh jason yeah actually this uh this sort of brings up something that i think is a really major issue and it's really um it's delicate and widespread in the way that we should view it. So there's a big problem with works from history um, being problematic, you know, like Louis Riel and so on. And um, uh, one of my favorite ones to show, I tell everybody, this is uh, Ramos' Danse de Sauvage. I really love showing that one because it's probably one of the most offensive orchestrated pieces and ripoffs of indigenous music that ever existed it's one of the earliest examples but looking back at these historical works and recognizing that they're problematic is probably the way we should be approaching this uh these historical works when you play them you know they wouldn't get if you looked at the the process of how they were created they would never get played today if they were created with that exact same process you know within this year somebody would definitely come forward and say you're absolutely offending this culture by performing this music or stealing these melody lines or your representation of what you think this culture is boiled down to this caricature is horribly and offensive um so that makes me think so what happens if you're say using one indigenous composer as a sort of reference point or some other indigenous indigenous work like somebody who's not indigenous inspired by an indigenous work to create a new work and you don't recognize the problematic issues that may have even existed when the original work was created and then you're using it and filtering that into your new work uh you're just snowballing snowballing this ignorance and carrying it forward into today where you should be looking back at it and saying what's the process that that person was doing and what was problematic with it back then and how can I you know remove that problematic situation and move forward in a more respectful manner from here just to follow up on that I I had a I agree completely it's it's a really serious issue and and 
but I experience it in a, with a slightly different way. And I think, Chris, you've had the same problem if, if I, the stories I've heard are, are true. Um, I had a choral piece that was not programmed because of the text. And my text was a little bit political, I'll admit. I'm at a stage where I feel like I can make some of those statements. And I used quotes from historical documents describing Indigenous people, and the choir wouldn't sing it. And in my mind, I wanted them to sing that because it was said about people, real people, you know, and, and the truth of that needs to be there. And it's uncomfortable, but it's the reality. And somehow we have to figure out how to engage with these things and not avoid them because white white people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, in, in, in totally. I've had the same the same thing. I have a piece with uh, Joshua Whitehead's poem about his grandmother who was murdered, and it's so intense. But it's also like these are the white words that you whitely said about um ab about her. So and it was like in the paper, like it you can't deny it. And I think that's that's something about where we are with the tug and pull of of working with with folks and it's like folks want to have an easy fix and we know that this road is long and 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 tenuous um and and we're not over it and we're still really hurt by everything um and like this year itself has been just so wild like and so painful with all of the unearthings and like things we knew about we've always known about it but having it come out um and it's not it's just not going to go away so it's like learning to walk together you know as it was supposed to be with the two row wampum that never happened yeah i also think that I also think that, that context is everything what, what just Pat and what Chris have just mentioned. It's up to, you know, it's really important. This is another reason why co conductors in relationship with the composer and the librettist or what have you, everything needs context. Um, I remember doing a piece, well, I've done a piece called Take the Indian and it's, it's taken from testimony from, from survivors from, um, from uh, their horrible experiences at residential school. It's again, pretty harsh. And I was doing it in Toronto and the kid, the, there was a kid's, a course that was doing was taking part in the performance at Trinity St. Paul's. So I do remember uh, that a child had taken the score back home, left it on the front desk. The parent walks in, picks it up, looks at it, and sees the words that her kids are singing, and it's absolutely friggin' horrified. And I get that. I would be horrified if I didn't know the context of what they're experiencing, uh, what they're actually doing. So I think it's really important for I I, I think going going back, I think that choristers and choir choir directors are getting a lot better at this, um, but it's every, you know, everything in context. And, and the piece that Chris is talking about, if you just saw that, you know, you know just uh, with no context, it would be a horrifying thing to read. But these are our stories. These are the words, this is what's happened to us. Um, and I also feel like, again, like what Chris is saying, this past year has been horrible and, and have you, but I felt like when the mainstream news got the the uh, the idea of all these uh, just, uh, these mass graves of our young ones, um, it was suddenly all the oxygen was sucked out of the room for Indigenous people, you know, because like we said, we've known this for a long time, and that suddenly it was this huge thing that there a moment of silence before an NHL game, you know, politicians suddenly get in on stage, I mean, in the platforms and saying how bad it was. Like, in the end, it'll be us that'll be writing about this in years to come. In the end, it will need the safe space and platform and the respect to be able to tell these stories that we've known for so long. And that's a massive challenge, whether it's orchestral dance, play, choral, you name it. It's, it's, we have huge stories to tell. We always have been having them, but I think it's just for, for the institutions that want to support us, they're going to have to work a lot harder to give context. Artists are going to have to be a little braver. Um, you know, I, I just, that's, the way I sort of feel uh, after this last 18 months, it's, you know, we need, we're hopefully changing a little bit, but a lot more work to do. I think this, um, we've already touched on the second question a bit, but I think it's the conversation has gone in this direction, which is, which is really important. Um, I really like 
being Rebel Alliance. <laughs> I think that was a perfect analogy. Um, I love it. <laughs> so, um, and Courage, I think, is asked. Yeah. Jason, uh, also has, Jason has oh, his little hand. I didn't see, oh, I didn't see your hand. Okay, sorry. I will let you speak. <laughs> Now you got to unmute yourself, Jason. <laughs> One tiny little statement just in support of what Andrew was saying. Uh, just to even if we just look at what we did today, every one of us that's in the panel right now decided to acknowledge the land that not just where we are, but where we are from. Uh, and yes, that's nice. And this is a new thing that I see happening. Uh, every institution I go to, every orchestra I go see, every performance I go see, no matter where I am in Canada or anywhere else, uh, they, they're they acknowledging the land that they exist with on. Uh, acknowledgement is nice for land, but what's wrong with acknowledging the stories that we're trying to tell you that have happened? Um, I don't like to share often my grandmother's residential school stories to, from the ones she told me. She told me very few. And uh, it's it's heartbreaking you know what i mean and like i said acknowledging that you know these stories happen and plenty of times i've heard from other people you know like oh we faced racism from this institution and that institution and i never once deny that it's happened i you have to acknowledge that those stories are out there and they're real um so not acknowledging what has happened to these people and what has happened to us as Indigenous people are like, you know, as I said, what's happened to my grandpa, my grandmother, my mom are in residence school. I acknowledge that their stories are 100% true, as horrible as they are. And as much as I'd like to prefer to not view those things happening to them, they did. And that's the way we should be looking at it. And once we start approaching music from that same level of respect and acknowledging these stories, I think we're going to start moving in the right direction. Chris. Oh, Patrick, sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> the okay. of, yeah, yeah so the I, kind of blend together. <laughs> I want to acknowledge some a couple points that, that Jason and, and others have brought up already about the whole idea of Indigenous music and Indigenous stories and who gets to tell what. And I know Chris has a document on, on uh, sovereignty. And I, I also want to acknowledge a talk that I heard a couple of years back from Parmela Tariwala about constructing her identity as a person in this land, you know, with many different things that one can be interested in. And I think they're, they've, they're farther along in visual arts with Indigenous art, artists there being able to define themselves how they want than we are in, in music. And, and so the thing is really what I'm seeing though, I, and I'm so excited about this show that we're gonna have here at the Chan Center next month with, with Marion Newman and, and Jessica McMahon and, and a whole, whole crew of great artists who are claiming many different kinds of music for themselves you know, for a whole variety of reasons. And I think that's one of the things about letting us tell our story as creators and artists in the way that we want, not trying to make us fit into some preconceived idea of where we fit and what we have to say. Because we, I think everybody here I see on the screen has a lot of different things to say and a lot of different angles to that we're, you know, it's not just one thing. And, and there is this kind of, in the university, we talk about the tax on Indigenous people because they're asked to do things that nobody else would be asked to do to explain things that we might not want to explain. As, as Jason said, you don't want to tell those stories. It's, it's ours to tell when. You can't expect me to tell the story. It's kind of, I remember uh, uh, Tanya Tagak, got really fired up one day on on uh, probably um, Twitter because somebody had stopped her you know, on the street in Toronto and asked her and touched her coat 
and wanted to hear the story about her coat and she was going to lunch. So she just said, sorry, I'm going to lunch. And the person followed her into the restaurant and was mad at her because she wouldn't tell them the story about her coat. You know, like, I mean, this, this idea that you can just ask people for stuff and that they have to give it to you is, is a very Western idea. It's, you know, as, as Dylan Robinson talks about hungry listening, that Western culture devours things and, and uses it for its own fuel, you know? And, and uh, I think somehow we've got to find a way to be much more equitable and face-to-face -face in how we interact with each other in our creative structures and getting the music created and in actually getting the music to the audience. And I think it will actually help the future of audiences for music, period. You know, to have that kind of a relationship, not you're down there worshiping somebody up on a stage who hasn't done anything yet for you, you know? So I, I think the whole power imbalance needs to be rethought. So the, the second um, part of this discussion, and it has just really amazingly gone into the, in this direction, is um, what are some important things for non-Indigenous composers and musicians to know with regards to respecting Indigenous cultural sovereignty? Um, and I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I think we can get a little bit deeper into it. And there is a link in the chat to uh, the document on Indigenous uh, musical sovereignty. Um, that can be referenced for this. Yeah, it's at the top. So a few of us uh, here gathered in Banff a few years ago um, to kind of really build on classical indigenous music. And uh, Melody and Beverly, I'm gonna honor them. They're also, were part of it. Um, and basically we, we hung out for 10 days and came up with this one page document. Um, and, and it's saying like, yeah, like, uh, folks, um, if if there is an indigenous story that you want to tell, like why do you want to tell it? But make sure that there's an indigenous lead artist at the top. Um, you know, like there's also like large projects that are not they're indigenous stories, but not with indigenous folks enough indigenous folks in it to tell it. Like Going Home Star, um, which was a a bit of a fiasco once we all found out about <laughs> Joseph. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just like, and it's also like things that we ask ourselves as composers too, like, why do we want to tell a story? Is it my story to tell? Um, you know, there's stories that are definitely not ours to tell. There's songs that are definitely not ours to share. Um, so just, yeah, why do you want to, why do you want to tell a story? goes to that. Uh, Jason? Yeah, so uh, this, I, I sort of already, as you said, mentioned something about this. So in Cree tradition, storytelling is a very, very big thing. It's it's how we pass on knowledge and how we pass on hunting traditions and so on. Um, I've been asked, because I'm Cree Métis and my grandmother's Cree, and I was raised in the Cree tradition to some extent uh, by her. Uh, she passed on a lot of great knowledge to me. And, you know, one of the things I think I love the most, and I've said this to many people, is the Cree sense of humor, which not very many people get. But if you're Cree, you love it. Uh, she passed that on to me. And um, I sort of have been asked to be a representative for not just Cree people, but all Indigenous people. And I wouldn't even be comfortable being a representative for the viewpoints of everybody in my own family, let alone my entire Cree community. And then all Indigenous people as a whole, um, I always tell people when I speak, I'm like, I can only speak from the Cree tradition because that's what I'm from and that's where I came from. Um, 
that's where my grandmother's from. That's what I've learned. I don't know anything about the Blackfoot traditions. I don't know anything about the Anishinaabe traditions. I, I, I'm not related to those. So when people come and bring me things and ask me to oversee them, <laughs> I'm like, I have no insight to give you on this cultural sovereignty. I can direct you in the right direction to people who would be able to help you, but I can't give you any specific viewpoints and give you a stamp of approval for this because that's highly unethical for me, even as an Indigenous person. Now, that goes just as far for me as a Cree person as well, too. I can't just take anything from the Cree culture. Songs belong to certain families. Songs belong to certain people. Every hunter has their own specific songs for communicating with the spirits of the animals that they're hunting. I would be horribly disrespectful to my own people for stealing that. Now, if you're a non-Indigenous person, think about how little leeway you should have if I'm putting that much restriction on myself as an Indigenous person. If you're a non-Indigenous person taking anything from any Indigenous cultures, horribly disrespectful. I would view it as horribly disrespectful doing it myself. So if you're not part of any Indigenous culture, you should really, really, really take a step back when you're doing anything with any sort of Indigenous cultural background or any Indigenous cultural heritage or stories or anything that's been pulled from Indigenous culture because of the marginalization and the sensitivity of all of those cultures across North America, that you should absolutely ask yourself, am I doing this respectfully? Have I engaged that community? Have I talked to the people? And not only have I talked to people, but have I talked to the right people about whether this is okay? Um, that's just my straightforward word of advice for anybody non-Indigenous and cultural sovereignty in Canada. Just to sort of like follow up on what um, what Jason is saying in terms of the Cree sense of humor, there's that old, uh, there's an old Cree joke about, uh, you never know somebody until you walk a mile in their moccasins. And at the end, you're a mile away, and you got their moccasins. <laughs> and that's sort of like this idea of like, um, well, you're in terms of like we so restrict, we so restrict ourselves, or we're we're being restricted in terms of if we want to play, uh, you know, or or immerse ourselves with classical music, you know, we never say to somebody that's a Scottish singer, oh, you can't sing Schubert, because you're not you're not German, you know, you don't, you know, it's like it seems to be we're all pigeonholed into these ideas of kind of like well, obviously I'm Cree, but I don't I can't tell the stories of an Inuk. Uh, or Algonquin or what have you. I just, but it just seems like we're, there's a different standard when it comes to sort of, because, you know, this, this settler country uses indigenous with a massive uh, uh, description, like, you know, indigenous is all one thing, as if Europeans were all one thing. It's just, it just seems like, um, and, and because of this industry that Pat was saying about classical music, and it's already pigeonholed us into a certain de uh, description or, or medium even, um, it, it just seems like our barriers are far greater um, to express ourselves and our stories um, and whatever we want to tell. But it just seems like we're still trying to get back up there. And, you know, I, I, we just, you know, what was it last month where Marie Schaefer passed away? And I haven't seen one real major article in mainstream news talking about his appropriation. His, you know, what I mean, like, I have not seen any serious uh, printed or descriptions about, yes, he's Murray Schaefer. I mean, that's great, but I, I haven't seen anything um, about the complex nature of, of what he did um, and his appropriation and his sort of like this idea of oh, land-based soundscapes and things like that. I, I, I'm a little bit disappointed in that because I thought this was an opportunity to be able to talk about not just him, but this idea of a white person appropriating not only our stories but our but our spiritual nature and a relationship with sound and, and the land so you know again going back to cmc and what jessica said before is like I, it might be time for a bit of a uh, of a cleaning or rethinking uh, of libraries and, and what have you and i'm totally not for one of these taking down monuments and i'm i'm, I'm more for the fact that we should discuss why ryerson is a bad name for university or higher education. Why statues of John McDonald, John McDonald are, are, are traumatic and problematic for indigenous cultures. I'm not for tearing them down. I'm, I, I'm for actually renaming the plaque or just keeping the discussion going. Um, and, that's up, um, and that's up to us, not politicians, because 
politicians are the least capable of changing our landscape, both social, artistically, um, even politically for Indigenous people. Um, I'm absolutely fed up with, with, with governments of all shades, all stripes. They are not going to help Indigenous people. I think it's going to be the artists. We are the prophets. We are the, the, the shamans of sound and what have you. Um, and, and hopefully our, our legacy will be here far after, you know, you know, century after stupid speeches by our, by our politicians. Yeah, I, I following up on, on that, I, I think what I often feel is that um, Canadian society, white society wants a simple answer or a simple category for a very complex issue. They want to talk about Indigenous people. I look around this, the squares, we're all really different. We have completely different experiences. We've, we've lived different things, it, you know, and just me moving from Red River out to Musqueam territory, all of a sudden hereditary chiefs are something that I didn't have a lot of exposure to um, in, in the prairies, you know, like the, the world is, is very different. And, and one of the great things that I found when I came here was the people said, okay, you hear about the golden rule, treat others the way you would like to be treated. We now need to go farther. We need to treat people the way they want to be treated, not you deciding how, you know, treat them the way you want to be. They may want to be treated quite differently than you, you want to be treated. And we have to respect that. And, and I think that's, it's a lot harder work, you know, and, and I think this is going to be a time of really hard work. There are no easy paths forward and often easy paths are performative at the best. <laughs> and and it's it's as organizations and institutions, as composers, you have been asked to do this very difficult work. And that may even mean retracting your own works <laughs> and apologizing for them. Um, I know for me personally, I would like to see these institutions acknowledge the harm that they've caused um, to Indigenous people because there's some, you know, people who would have been composers or performers and they didn't make it past their second lesson because of the teacher they had. Um, so having people acknowledge that, it, for me, that's super important because I still struggle with that as an Indigenous woman working in this field. <laughs> every day it's always it's always there it's always looking at me in the face and I have trouble saying yes to things because these institutions won't um, take responsibility for the people that work for them um, and and acknowledge that these people have been racist or programmed racist works or have stolen knowledge from indigenous people for their work um, and it's not decommissioning these works either. I, I am also very against that because there needs to be a reckoning with this stuff. And, and so by uh, taking them out of a collection, by throwing them out, you are also erasing that history that is within these institutions. Um, and then it looks like a clean, a clean plate. <laughs> and then that's not, that's not true. Um, Chris. <laughs> yeah, and, and thinking about like, you know, going one step further you know it's not about welcoming us into or how do you create a welcoming space it's inviting us into your space we have been like rejected from your space so many times that we don't feel included to begin with so we need full invitations we need to be like oh like like this conversation is a full invitation for us to actually talk with you um but it's not something that we would do on our on our own you know like we need to be invited now we need to be honored and, and invited um into these spaces uh, jason yeah um it just makes me think I, I i always tell people who are not indigenous because my thesis for my composition is really engaging my own community and finding a respectful way to engage my own people, which is a really, really weird, um, like sort of split 
brain sort of way of thinking of things because I am part of the community, but then I also respect everybody around me and my community. Um, but I, I came across this one article by Alfred J. Fisher. I, uh, I was just pulling it up while everybody was, I was listening to everybody. It's called Searching for the Authentic, the True North and the True Composer. Uh, and he's a non-Indigenous person who engaged with an Indigenous community. And um, he didn't tell the story of that community because as Chris said earlier, it's not his story to tell. But what he did is he told his story of that community and he he went through this thing called a, like what i call the self-reflective process the entire time every time he was telling the story and looking at it there's lots of him questioning his motives and what he was doing and questioning what he's done and how it's going to be viewed by this very very sensitive community that he's working within um i i found it absolutely telling of you know uh, a, not just a good process of like looking at what you're doing but also how he engaged with the community and then how the community embraced him as a member of it even though he's not born of that community so he said you know somebody he knew in the community had passed away and he didn't know what to do if he should send his condolences or somebody but it was somebody he knew in person and so he sent a, 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 a one of the council chiefs he sent them a, a message and said you know i'm really sorry to hear the passing so and so and they said he goes you know thank you but you can send it to their family if you're with us you're with us you know what i mean so they embraced him because of the fact that he was respecting their community and as patrick said and uh, not just thinking about how he would treating them the way how the way he would want to be treated but how they want to be treated and how they want it to be respected and how they want their would want their culture to be respected and deeming what's off limits and what's on limits and so on and what can be shared and what can not so um and respecting their story their tradition of stories and how to engage and and tell his story and his engagement with the community is his story and he is the right person to tell that story so i just thought that would be interesting to sort of put that article out there because it, it, it's it's definitely something if you're not an indigenous composer in any indigenous person anyway and you're you're interested in this type of composition it's a good place to start and it's written very very it's an antidote it's not really an article it's not academic in any sense so it's definitely worth a read for anyone uh, i absolutely loved it so i just thought i'd put that out there There's an interesting like um, experience that I had this last week because uh, you know we're talking about something that I always thought was almost um, impossible to to be able to to break through the institution of a particular you know the industry of classical music and how indigenous can re uh, voices or composers or artists can really claim not reclaim because we never had it in the first place I, that's kind of the same way I feel about reconciliation we never had a real true uh, respectful understanding between settlers and indigenous people ever. So reconciliation is a kind of a odd word to use and what we're trying to strive for. But I saw just recently last week, Night Raiders, um, the movie by uh, Danis Goulet. And it's, uh, I saw it, it was kind of an, a, a, an awakening. It's like, oh my God, here's this female indigenous director that had made what we can consider a big major movie. Um, and I, I highly recommend seeing it, but I thought, well, if that can happen, surely an indigenous artist could be able to, to have a total um, collaboration with an orchestra uh, or an opera company and do something with their original vision. We're going back to what Pat said, that 20 minute rehearsal, and then you go, and, and then you go. It's like surely that there could be a real understanding. I mean, this is like obviously a major Hollywood movie or, or, or can be done then surely we can make at least a half hour of a, of a ballet or a symphony um done with the proper protocols the proper respect and artistic collaboration um and I, that made me very hopeful when i saw that movie you know i i thought surely this can be done if if she can break down um all those barriers it's certainly you know to make a major movie um, a major motion picture like that tell an indigenous story, even a sci-fi story set in the future, then surely we should be able to have the same opportunities with an orchestra. We have great ideas. We have you know, an understanding about orchestra and music making and storytelling. We just like to be able to 
um, have that, that opportunity rather than the one off. Well, you have 20 minutes, go. Like it's just, it's until, until that can be solved, then um, we're just, I hate to use the word tokenism, but uh, that's what it seems like in the past. Yeah. I feel like I just played with the VSO and I also was expecting the 20 minute rehearsal. Um, and, and they gave me like the times that I had to be there. And then uh, literally the day before I flew, they gave me like the full rundown and I was like, holy crap, they gave me two hours uh, for each rehearsal. And I was just playing like like 15 minutes with them, um, which was like super incredible. But at the same time, backstage, right before I go on stage, somebody's like, so, but who arranged that? Like, who did that for you? And I was like, me. And they're like, no, 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 but like, who arranged it? Did you do all that? And I was like, but I'm the composer. Like, you would never, ever ask somebody like, you you would never ask a white man that, you know? It was, yeah, quite, quite incredible. But Vancouver did give me a lot of time. So it's happening. It is moving. We just have to keep yelling (laughs) and repeating ourselves. (laughs) And and I think one of the things, uh, thinking back to my, I did six years as composer in residence with the Winnipeg Symphony. And my job there was essentially to be facilitator for these kinds of things. So I would go out and meet with a drum singing group and figure out how to make it work you know so i had to go back and then lobby for elders to come in and a tobacco ceremony you know and that took rehearsal time and there's a lot of people sitting there getting paid a lot of money while we go through that ceremony but it had to be done you know so in a way the canadian music center can think about how it facilitates protocols and proper relations with the different people that should be represented, you know, and that that's going to take a a really different way of thinking, depending on where those folks come from and what their traditions are and what their expectations are, what their needs are. Again, we we talk a lot because all all of us kind of work in classical music, Western classical music for at least part of what we do. And, And so we always kind of gravitate while we could do a symphony, we could do a ballet. Well, what if we don't want to do that? You know, again, you know, like what is, you know, the, this kind of pinnacle and it's, it's something that I think the world is trying to figure out, like, where is the appropriate place to do this thing? You know, is a concert hall the right place? Why is the orchestra in the concert hall? Who's paying for that? You know, what, what, what boxes are being ticked? Like, maybe we need to re, you know, like, again, going back to Regina, just because I, I know a couple stories from there, you know, when Buffy St. Marie came, they went to the res, right? That was important to go to the res, not to just bust people into the concert hall, right? You've got to think all of these things through because making this one, you know, and I'm running a big concert hall, but so it's crazy for me to say this, but maybe it's not the best place for a lot of things, you know? So, so I think we need to be very thoughtful about how we, we do these things, but then we need the facilitation. So whether it's people are going out or people are coming in, how do we make that work in a way that, that makes sense? But in the same way, like, yeah, going to the res with an orchestra is amazing. I've also played with Regina and they put me at the univer- the indigenous university in a glass teepee and like did not think about how that would sound and like and pigeonholed me 1000% put the indigenous person in the in the indigenous spot and didn't give me the main stage didn't give me the right amount of the sound equipment and so like the show is compromised because I didn't I didn't get the the things that I needed to properly do a, sh- a show of that size and that scale so I think yeah I think there's like we do want to be on the main stage. We do want it. Like, we are speaking the same language in uh, in our approaches to music right now. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, Chris. And I think the thing is that in 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 some ways, we also need to acknowledge that mistakes are going to be made. 
and that it's how we deal with each other as those things get made. You know, yeah. did they recognize what happened and, and how that impacted you? You know, and how do we, what was the next experience like? You know, so how do we make that better and continually make it better so that people have access to things the way they need to? I, I totally feel that uh, also like what you're saying, Pat, is like, I, I think I was, I was part of that project. Well, I was part of a project when Buffy in 2010, a scan of where the Regina Symphony, which was actually privately produced and funded by an East Indian and a Russian. Uh, I can't remember his name. He was a concert master at the time. Those two came together, had the vision, brought Buffy in, commissioned me. And I went up to Piapot Reserve where Buffy, Buffy was from. Um, it wasn't the orchestra. It was, it was just more Buffy because that's where her blood is from. But I also feel that it's important to debrief. It's important to, you know, like after you've done, a, you know, like even if it seems successful and there's all the padding to the back, take some time a month or a week later and ask the artist or artists, how, you know, how did you feel? How, what can, what can we learn? You know, like, I guess listening is kind of important before and after, you know, because mistakes will be made and have been made and probably should be made. I feel that it's kind of very important that we, that we, we all learn. I've made mistakes. Uh, Producers have made mistakes, conductors have made mistakes. I think it's, it's, it's okay if we make mistakes, as long as we learn from them. I mean, that's, a, that's an old adage, but it's, it's, it's particularly important with the spirit of collaboration with true respect. Yeah, I just like to add to that briefly before before Jason, because I've been in recent contacts with the Regina Symphony and they asked me what I would like to do. Um, and it was very open. And so I said, well, I want to play a concerto with the, with the orchestra. And now that, you know, I'm hoping that that's, we can continue those chats and, uh, you know, there's a relationship there. I've talked to our chief because the chief has worked with the symphony orchestra before. And so they're, they're looking at strengthening those relationships. Um, and I'm very lucky that my community has that. Right. So there's, I feel okay about it, but I'm also very vocal about expressing um <laughs> things that aren't okay these days i wasn't always in the past but i you know i hearing these stories i feel like they're maybe hopefully they're learning from what has happened and um yeah uh jason yeah i just wanted to say like this sort of came up when you know with the thing of Kamloop school and all these unmarked graves that are being found and I remember talking to some of my family because my my cousin Samson is the chief deputy of elders um, in Wiskaganish right now, Samson Wishy. And uh, I was talking to him and a few other people and they said, they go, you know, people think that just because they're not indigenous that we don't see that they're feeling these issues. You know what I mean? These, the, these atrocities that are happening and things that have been covered. And they're like, we don't. And then that just sort of made me think in my mind, I've never met an Indigenous person in my life that isn't completely filled with love and understanding. <laughs> so whenever somebody says, oh, I didn't know what to do, I'm like, well, did you ask them? And then they're like, well, no, I didn't say. I'm like, well, every Indigenous person I've ever met, if you just say, hey, I was just wondering, what is that? Could, do you mind? And you know, if they say, no, I'm on my way to lunch, <laughs> as Tanya Tagak said, respect that. But most of them would be, if they have the time and you're really willing to listen. They will explain things to you. I, I rarely turn people down when they ask about my Cree culture or my grandmother or any of those stories, unless I'm on my way to lunch <laughs> or something along those lines. So um, I just kind of wanted to bring up because I, I think we may have missed it, but Marilyn, uh, I don't want to say the last name because I want to pronounce it incorrectly, Wolovic, but uh, <laughs> uh, asked if Andrew about the indigenizing of European classical music and uh, the against the grain Messiah complex. And I, I've been familiar with this as well and whether it was problematic. I don't know if it's necessarily problematic to me. Um, I kind of view the Messiah complex as not coming from a marginalized and sensitive culture. So uh, using indigenous performers to present the Messiah complex is not necessarily problematic on that sense. I don't know how other people view um, 
I just view it as an employing indigenous performers, but that might fall into what Andrew was saying earlier about tokenism and what Chris was saying about tokenism. So I, mean, I, I just thought I would bring I, it up I, <laughs> since I somebody asked. Sorry, I didn't actually see, see the question because I'm so horrible. My ADD just like, you know, we're trying to, but um, I see the question now. Actually, when that first came out, I was full of great pride, um, both both because I, I know most of the soloists and Renalta, who was one of the producers and Jonathan Adams, uh, for those of you who don't know, he is an absolute world. There's no, he's an absolute world class performer, particularly in the early music. Uh, he is, he is a shining star, um, as most of those other soloists are. Um, so I have no problem with something like that per se. Um, I, I guess, sort of like, I guess this idea of, I think that there were enough indigenous people involved in that project that's not the same thing as sort of like, having a white artistic crew indigenizing Pierre Gint, which I saw at the National Arts Center, which was almost insulting um, because Ian Hussan and myself and Bobby Carroll were part of the, we were given the, you know, the opening and then the second half was all, you know, like it was ridiculous, um, yeah. but it was ridiculous. But again, I, I guess we, you know, we all know Messiah is a beloved, um, a beloved canon, you know, in the classical repertoire, um, I mean, it might be triggering for some people, like, you know, the name of, you know, Messiah, like that's triggering. And um, just as an aside, I don't know if many people know that Handel actually had stakes in one of the most lucrative slave trading, uh, slave trading industries at the time in the 17th century. So, you know, it's like, I guess maybe that's some type of, but like, it's just about history. It's like, um, what does that piece mean? What does that piece mean to people? Um, well, nice call scene. It's a beautiful piece to hear at Christmas or Easter. And um, I think it's great. I, I, per I, I personally think that project was inspiring because it actually had Indigenous producers and it was well thought up and they found the money to, to, to do wonderful filming. So I support something like that. Um, and I'm doing some projects. I was actually out west. I just had a talk with J uh, Jacob Gramet from Music Intima. We're doing a project in May, uh, reimagining... Um, Elizabethan music and what what it had been like uh, had they actually really uh, respected indigenous people rather than just coming over and taking tobacco and uh, and you know doing slavery and things like that. So it's it's interesting. There's there's still there's still actually uh, beautiful options I think, but I just feel like for most of the time it doesn't quite get unless you have indigenous advisors or collaborators. It's still going to be the same old same. Yeah, and it goes back to like indigenous leads in the project. Like Ronaldo was like, like fully in the front of that, and it's about again allowing allowing us to to be the lead if you're going to use us. Um, and and also, I don't think it it turns it turns into collaboration and not like tokenism when it's like, and it also. You know, I'm sure everyone got paid really well, and that's also something I I love. I think it was Jason and then Patrick. Yeah, I actually just wanted to say something that I, I wanted to bring back up because uh, I got sidetracked by the question. So um, that's not actually something that Patrick said earlier, where, um, you know, maybe the concert hall isn't the place to place us uh, every single time and or just place us where, as Chris said, um, in the center of what you consider your most Indigenous area on campus, uh, that may not be the best place. And um, I remember... I, I got asked to be a part of a project and, and it actually worked out really well for me. It was something that I wanted to do where they asked me to write a piece that was, as they said, indigenous, which I am indigenous. I just wrote a piece that I was going to write anyway. Um, but they also wanted to comment on climate change. And I said, I'm like, you're probably going to get a lot of pushback from the other indigenous composers you ask because people make this mistake that just because indigenous people are very aligned, you know, with the spirituality of the earth and, and, and the beings around them, um, or the non-human spirituality, I like to call it, uh, that, that we're sort of like Canada, like the world's environmentalists, but uh, we don't, we don't align with, you know, 
Greenpeace all the time and PETA all the time. Uh, so please don't assume that we do. Uh, but you know, if if I hear somebody offers me a project and asks, hey, we're doing something that's on this, would you be willing to write something along those subject matter? If I feel I have something to say as a composer, I'll write a piece. If I don't, I'll say, no, I don't want to do that because I don't really have any <laughs> thoughts or processes on that subject matter that I wish to write about right now, so I'm not going to. And I thought that was something that uh, kind of went with what Patrick and Chris were saying earlier. Um, don't just assume, ask, you know, or, you know, what would be nice is if they had a concert and they said, we'd like to hire all Indigenous composers, what would you want the subject matter or the theme of this conference, uh, this uh, this concert to be? What would you want this to be? Uh, when we started, uh, me, Jessica, and uh, Chris have all got signed on to work with the CPO recently. And I found that that was one of the things I really enjoyed about working with them was they sort of asked us, what would you like the title of this to be? You know what I mean? What would the subject matter of this, what would you want it to be? They asked us specifically. And I thought that was just such a great, like you said, that welcoming environment of what is what is important to you? What do you feel like doing? And we were sort of given really broad ideas to write, but everything was our own. Um, those Those types of approaches I think are, that sort of welcoming space that you're talking about creating. Yeah, and just to go back to the uh, Messiah complex for for a second, I think it, it I think it's it's a really good example of how things can go right when when people are are working together. But I I have heard stories about the initial lead up into that and how certain people were asked to be represented with regalia. And I think the challenge for, you know, many people, uh, how do I say this right? I mean, the Canadian policy of taking Indigenous kids away from their families has impacted a lot of us differently, right? In, in, in that we don't necessarily, we didn't necessarily grow up in community we didn't grow up with our families. We've connected with them later in life or tried to find our way home somehow and how to represent ourselves as people who grew up not knowing of some of these connections. And, and so I, I think just in dealing with it, please be sensitive to how people may not feel comfortable doing certain things, even though they represent the tradition that we come from because we don't feel we're close enough to it to 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 represent it and and as jason talked about not representing his whole community or even his whole family i mean i i feel the same way about a, a lot of things from from the metis tradition you know like i my mom and my sisters and my brother i mean they've passed on a lot of stuff to me but it's late in life it's it's not it's something that i really struggle with in terms of how I identify and how I construct my identity in the art that I create, you know, and it, it, it's so I, I think it's just challenging to assume, you know, like I have a sash, I, you know, and I, it's in my closet and I take it out every once in a while and it's my great grandfather's colors of his sash and I feel really great about that, but I don't wear it out very much because I kind of not sure I should, you know, so, so I think how we are asked to appear, I think is, is something that we also need to be careful with because people have their, their experiences. I know I, I was at a conference where a, a person got up and said, I'm a stolen person on stolen land, you know? And, and I think we got to recognize the harshness of that. I definitely feel that a stolen person on stolen land being adopted myself and that um, journey um, and I feel very grateful to be able to have my family connections and my family and these you know what I have because I know a lot of the people a lot of my friends are adopted and they don't they don't have that at all um, so thank you for sharing that um, <laughs> got me a little emotional <laughs> Um, so we have just over 10 minutes left, um, and if it's all right with y'all, I think it would be nice to open up for questions um, from those who are here, um, especially following up from that really good question um, from Marilyn. Um, and I do apologize, I was hoping to introduce him, but I was, everything was going so good, I just left it. And um, thank you for bringing it up, Jason. Um, 
<laughs> Are there any questions? You can uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand and then, and then speak them. Also, the panelists uh, can refuse to answer those questions if they so wish um, and not answer. So there's, it's, it's up to the panelists if they want to answer the question or not, um, if it's appropriate or not. Um, okay, I shall open it up to everyone here. Nothing. <laughs> or I'm, I'm not looking at people's hands. Sorry. I'm going to just take a look at. There's a hand. Okay. <laughs> uh, whoever has your hand up, you, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Gavin Goodwin. I'm the music librarian here at Mount Allison University. I know it doesn't actually have my name in, in the Zoom window there. Um, and this is something I apologize. I've been sort of ducking in and out of the conversations that I've been at work, and people have been coming and asking me questions. So I, it may have been something that was discussed and I had fortunately missed. Um, but especially in the context of this conversation with the CMC um, and, and libraries, that's sort of a, a, a huge portion of what the CMC does in terms of promoting Canadian music and, and making it accessible. And I, I know Chris. I uh, mentioned something briefly about libraries at, at one point. Um, something that's been really interesting for me uh, from the perspective of both a musician and a librarian is sort of finding the most ethical way of representing people and, and their music within library collections and sort of what role that plays. Um, I don't know if I have a really specific question about this, um, but if, if any of you do have personal um, perspective on, on how your own music could or or should be represented within in library collections. I would, I would love to hear um, more about that. I, I guess maybe the one thing I'll add to is, is sort of some of my research recently has been focused on on really the ethical ways of representing people's identities within library catalogs and using that as a way of allowing people to uh, to, to discover new composers of, of diverse identities, but while also walking that type or tight rope of avoiding issues like tokenization, for example. Uh, Jason? Ah, one second. <laughs> Sorry, I said that mute. Um, yeah, so this kind of did come up a little bit. We sort of talked about, um, you know, I got asked to post pieces and people say, or is it going to be Indigenous? And what they mean is it going to sound Indigenous <laughs> is usually what they're asking me. But I tell them, well, like, if you want to classify it as Indigenous, you can because I am Indigenous. Um, it's the same thing, too, as if a African-American person composes a piece, you can classify it as African-American because they're African-American. Uh, I think for me, viewing Indigenous music is that way. If it's coming from an Indigenous person, it's Indigenous music. Um, don't classify music that sounds Indigenous as Indigenous music, because that doesn't always mean that it's Indigenous music. It just means it sounds like Indigenous music, means it referencing Indigenous music, or it's an Indigenous person referencing their music of their culture. Uh, and that may be for just one piece. Uh, so this sort of did come up. I, I don't know how everybody else feels, but that's for me personally, that's the way I view it. Yeah, I think so. I work a lot in in art collection and, and art, the art world as a curator right now. And there's actually a lot of parallel research going on around the ethics of collecting Indigenous works and stories as well that I think could be very helpful um, within within the context of, of that. I would also say um, a, a lot of these composers are still living, so you can ask them how they want to be classified. Um, and those that don't may have may have descendants or uh, who may help with that um, kind of classification because, well, I used to work at the CMC Prairie Region Music Library, and there was no way to find an Indigenous composer in the collection. So I think that it's very, it is a really, it's good to have these questions being asked now. 
um, yeah. Yeah, actually, this is, okay. I mean, working with the CNC library collection um, in, in Quebec was sort of like the starting point and sort of starting to explore all these and there's definitely a lot of work that's going to be done. Um, is, I, I kind of wanted to follow up with something that Chris, if maybe I can ask you directly that you mentioned about um, potentially whether or not there's items that should be withdrawn, for example, from, from the CMC collection for, for various reasons. I don't know if, um, I was kind of just curious about that, that thought that you had given and maybe wanted a little bit more follow up. Um, yeah, to. you know, and there's also like a little bit with what Jessica was going on, like, cause I, I from what I remember, I'm not currently a member of the CMC, so I couldn't do my research uh, <laughs> yesterday when I was like, right, tomorrow. Um, from what I remember, there's like quite a few works also within the CMC library that are a little bit more like um, just full theft of songs um, where, and it's like, is it ethnomusicology or is it yours to take? You know, that's it's a big, those are big, big questions. and. And so there's like, from what I remember, there was some some stuff in there that maybe that's not the right home for it, for it, and maybe it should go back to where where it hence came from. Um, so kind of things along that line, um, and then always like just always reiterating, you know, like um, I think Jana here has like what what's appropriate view of, of the land for a white person. It's it's your own perspective. You've got to write music from your own perspective um, and, and understand that indigenous sounds are not necessarily yours and not your perspective. Um, so it's like, you know, what what is your history and what is your relationship with the land? And like, is it complicated because your grandfather um maybe took it like my okay like this is complicated because like uh i'm half cree half mennonite so like my one half of my family took land from the other half of my family like literally and so it's it's literally complicated and um and that but that gives me a perception of the land and that's that gives me a perception which i can talk to but it only I can talk to it because it's only my perception. Thank you for the, the insights. I appreciate it. Um, I think we have time for one last question. So Glenn has a question. So hello, everyone. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Jeremy Strawn for helping to organize this, Jessica, for uh, chairing and all of the panelists for sharing sharing so much with us. Um, and all of you for for participating. Um, I'll just say that that uh, uh, Jeremy is is a, a, a researcher that has been looking at the CMC catalog for more than a decade, and is really helping to guide our thinking in terms of how how to move forward. The uh, the board at the CMC has struck uh, uh, something that is I think very important. Um, group to help guide this process, the accountability for change. A number of uh, members are here, including uh, Claire Pellerin, who is the chair of the committee. Um, and so we have begun the long journey. Um, this is part of the discussion, and I thank you all for your frank and, uh, and uh, candid um, comments and requests and direction. Um, this does need to be Indigenous-led, and um, and it's complicated. The Louis Riel is a big glaring example, um, but it took many, many years to resolve. And there are several hundred uh, works out of many thousands, but, but several hundred works that uh, have been identified that we need to work on. And it's going to be a slow, slow process. And so we're uh, pre prepared for that. Um, Dylan Robinson is involved with the, with the group as well. and. Uh, it's going to take resources and we have support, at, at least initially, uh, to begin the process so that people get paid for the work they're going to do. Um, so uh, this is a very important listening opportunity for the Canadian Music Centre. Um, I've been all ears and, well, and typing notes. So I just want to say a big thank you and that, that the work to unveil and, and figure out how to deal with those many works 
looking backward is one thing, and that's complicated, of course, but looking forward and providing education and resources. Um, there is a, a whole new uh, section of our website that is devoted to uh, numerous statements that the board has, has approved with, uh, with respect to um, uh, indigenous engagement and indigenous participation. Um, and uh, um, and and the accountability for change is helping to really guide our thinking. Thank you for that. Um, we are exactly at 2.30 and lots of people have places to go and next meetings to be at. Um, so thank you everyone who is still here for being